What things come to your mind when you think about the UK? I know these days it's all about Brexit, but having the world's fifth largest economy should mean that people there are, well, for the most part, living well, right? Well, think again. Into this man. His name is Philip Alston. I think the employment statistics are very impressive. I think poor people need to Yeah, he's an Australian international law scholar and human rights practitioner, as his title states. He's also the current special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights. This interview will be coming up in the program. Well, love him or hate him, governments don't like him, but people actually like him a lot, especially when he paid a visit to the UK. The dislike since he is pointing out where the government has failed. In case case, well, you have poverty, hunger, and also lack of jobs. Hi, I'm Kamit Tapway, and in this edition of Economic Divide, we will look at the Special Rapporteur's assessment on the effects of austerity on the UK, and other people are suffering due to the impact of austerity. Poverty is really a major challenge in the United Kingdom. And the UN's Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights published his report in mid-November after a two-week fact-finding mission to the UK. The bottom line of what Professor Philip Olson said was this, UK policies inflict unnecessary misery. Since 2010, the Conservative government has announced more than £30 billion in cuts to welfare payments, housing subsidies, and social services. This campaign of budget cutting has delivered a huge shift in British life. Soaring use of food banks, increasingly visible homelessness, and cuts to school budgets have increased concerns about the Conservative Party's fiscal strategy. To highlight how much food banks have become a part of life in the UK now. Before austerity, before the cuts, we gave out food parcels in the thousands. Now we give them out in the millions. I mean, it's actually the escalation in the number of people that need food parcels in one of the richest countries in the world is something to be embarrassed about. There's no doubt that they've been pretty severe in the amount of cuts that have taken place uh, because, of course, they don't even allow for inflation. Um, and then you're doing cuts uh, on top. So you're bound to hit people on these very low incomes. Um, and they, of course, have attacked things like housing benefit, child benefit. So I don't think there's any dispute that the Conservative government has made a conscious effort. Now, they would argue it's to help encourage people into work, but I think that this actually, um, actually makes it harder for a lot of these people to actually get jobs because, you know, they need the money to, you know, eat properly, um, house themselves properly, and they're dealing with all these problems that have been inflicted upon them. Many experts believe the austerity measures taken by the government in 2010 were, first of all, a political decision. Our conservative politicians who resent the creation of the NHS will be quite happy to see our NHS transformed into United States of America style healthcare system where they feel for your wallet before they feel for your pulse. We have life expectancy differences across this country that are horrendous and huge. In Scotland, for example, the, big, the gap between the life expectancy of the best off and the worst off is 26 years.
fact, the UK is the world's fifth largest economy. It contains many areas of immense wealth. We could talk about different industries, but in particular, for example, the London Stock Exchange. That does very well. But here are the questions that are perplexing. Uh, for example, why are 14 million people, as you're about to see, that's a fifth of the population in the UK, living in poverty? The other question that comes to mind, why are 4 million of them living below the poverty line? That's an important question. Also, why are 1.5 million destitute unable to actually afford living in the UK? I mean, is this a result of austerity, as the UK Special Rapporteur is stating? Or is it a result of the economy, for example? In Philip Olson's 24-page report, he points out that austerity in Britain is in breach of four UN human rights agreements relating to women, children, disabled people, and economic and social rights. The report gives out some alarming findings. What I've found is that despite the great riches in uh, the UK, despite the fact that it's the fifth largest economy, that London is really one of the top cities in the world in so many respects, uh, there are nonetheless one in four people living in poverty in the country. That's according to UK measures. Uh, and there are one and a half million who are estimated to live in destitution, uh, according to the Joseph Browntree Foundation and various other uh, highly reputable groups. So there's a really big poverty problem. Given the far-reaching consequences of austerity measures, experts say that cutting benefits is not a good way of saving. It is an instance of being penny-wise, pound-foolish. It's a problem for a long time to come. And of course it is totally unacceptable in a modern economy like Britain in the 21st century. It's totally unacceptable and they're quite right about this. And of course what makes it even more unacceptable is that there's a huge cost to society down the road of this child poverty uh, because it affects people's whole life spans and um, they, some, some end up in jail, some go into drugs and other things. So we spend a lot of money solving those problems down the road. Olsen was particularly concerned about a new system known as universal credit. Although in its initial form it represented a potentially major improvement in the system, it is fast falling into universal discredit. The major thing that I found around the country is people complaining bitterly about the way in which various welfare policies are being implemented. So universal credit is sort of emblematic in many ways the uh, delay of five to 12 weeks before you get any benefits just plunges people who are already uh, experiencing great difficulty into a black hole. I've seen firsthand the damage that Universal Credit is doing. You know, we see people week after week come in who are in rent arrears, who can't afford to feed themselves, can't afford to feed their children. We had a woman who was a diabetic who came in who hadn't eaten for two days. So we're here to call on the government to completely abolish Universal Credit. Once a world leader in Social Security after World War II, the UK is now a world leader in self-imposed austerity. Now comes another aspect of this report which is alarming, namely child poverty. Philip Olsen says that almost one in every two children is poor in the UK. Also that progress in reducing poverty, well, it has flatlined and that child poverty is rising, 
and more alarmingly, it's projected to rise in the coming years. Are his findings actually credible? Is he one of the few making such claims? The Institute for Fiscal Studies predicts a 7% rise in child poverty between 2015 and 2022. Although overall poverty levels have remained quite constant under the conservative government, most measures show that poverty has risen among working families and children. The Institute for Fiscal Studies predicts a 7% rise in child poverty between 2015 and 2022, and various sources predict that child poverty rates will go as high as 40%. Critics say this high level of child poverty in Britain is the question of political motivation and political ideologies. If the British government, they argue, was really determined to eradicate child poverty, it could do it in a short period of time. That is not going to happen because the current British government and indeed um, uh, previous British governments did not have their priorities correct. The priority, probably the number one priority of the British government and it's demonstrated by how much money it has spent on this, is renewing its nuclear deterrent to remain one of the big boys in the world. worsening problem, child poverty itself, can be the root cause of many social problems. And we know that children who grow up in poverty are more likely to die in the first year of life, for example. They're more likely to develop chronic health conditions such as asthma, obesity and overweight. They're more likely to develop behavioural problems and struggle whenever they reach school. And these effects extend across the life course. Alston's report coincided with a critical stage in negotiations for Brexit, scheduled for the end of March. The departure of Britain from the European Union will certainly put pressure on the British economy. If present policies continue, it's the people who are living in poverty who are going to be most seriously affected. I think that has a particular resonance in the Brexit context because the great majority of observers would agree <clears throat> that the uh, Leave side was uh, fueled at least in part by the sense of alienation, the sense of economic insecurity, the sense of not having been cared for by the system uh, on the part of a lot of those who supported it. So if there's then this sort of double whammy where the people who wanted to leave because they uh, thought they were getting a bad deal suddenly find themselves with a, a very inadequate welfare system to cushion what will be have to be government cuts, uh, that will be a big problem. The IMF says that a no-deal Brexit could cost the UK economy somewhere between 5% and 8% of GDP and a loss of thousands of pounds per household. Brexit is certainly not going to help with child poverty because it's going to make the United Kingdom poorer. It will mean there will be even less money uh, collected in taxes and their government budget will be worsening so they will not be so keen to spend money and in fact um, there could be even worse problems because Brexit is not a plus for the economy, it's a clear minus. And then again, if, it, if it's bad, it's normally the people at the bottom that get most affected. Uh, the people at the top manage to find ways around things, but uh, people at the bottom don't. Norman. Mr Speaker, sadly, universal credit is only one of a string of failures of this government. Everywhere you look, it's a government in chaos. 
on the most important issues facing this country, it's a shambles. Brexit negotiations made no progress. Bombardier and other workers facing redundancy. Most working people worse off. Young people pushed into record levels of debt. A million elderly people not getting essential care. Our NHS at breaking point. Mr Speaker, this Government is more interested in fighting amongst themselves than in solving these problems. Philip Olsen states that the UK government is in denial, and some factions openly disagree with him. This is what the government has said in response to Philip Olsen's findings. It said, we completely disagree with this analysis, with this government's changes. Household incomes have never been higher. Income inequality has fallen. It goes on to say the number of children living in workless households is at a record low, and there are now one million fewer people who are living in absolute poverty compared with 2010. Clearly, there's something wrong here. The government needs to realize there is a problem. Acknowledgement is the first step. While one of five people in Britain are living in poverty, the government is in denial. The worst way of dealing with such a problem. My concern was to find out how the government feels about it, what they're doing. And what I met for the most part was a policy of denial that we don't think there's a problem, that we are very happy that our full employment policies are working and that takes care of poverty. Well, first of all, the British government has to accept that there is a very serious level of child poverty in the UK. Number two, the British government needs to start working far more closely with charities which uh, work towards eradicating poverty, including child poverty. And number three, the British government needs to prioritise. If child poverty, poverty in general in the UK, is to be eliminated, In addition, there needs to be far greater funding for the education, health and housing sectors. Unless the British government takes these measures, the current levels of poverty will remain and in fact will continue to grow. Britain has historically had governments not caring much about ordinary people. Many British governments have been composed of people from the upper classes living in a very different Britain. I think one of the problems is, is that if you look at the Conservative Party, many of the members of parliament have had very privileged backgrounds so they don't actually understand the issue and the issue is is that there's a lot of poor people in society that haven't had such a good start in life and such good schools as they went to and of course they've never experienced it so they don't really know that the problem exists and how to deal with it even today in 2018 the political and economic system in the uk does resemble a feudal system um, uh, Britain is uh, deeply divided along class lines and of course that, is, that, that stems from having a feudal system. So that is something that needs to be acknowledged and that is something that needs to be replaced entirely. Last but not least, the role of the British media in selling the austerity measures should not be ignored. They have been promoting this idea that people in the West are provided with all the best things, the envy of the rest of the world. In financially difficult situations, and uh, you have to work the whole day to uh, afford the very basic kind of life that is possible. And at the same time, you have the idea that, well, I'm in the ideal situation, ideal country, or I'm, at the, I'm in the best possible situation in the world, then that makes it easier for politicians to uh, reject uh, calls for reform or to continue the way that they they've been working and to convince the uh, 
majority of the society that this is how things work. This is how things can work. One of the most alarming things that Philip Olson's findings reveal is the way that the UK government has actually dealt with poverty. Check out this tweet. Philip Olson said that the UK government has a set of talking points about poverty and employment that 1. Don't address poverty. 2. Use carefully chosen and misleading statistics to paint a rosy picture. Just some of the things that this tweet actually said. But let's find out more about the online activity. Maria joins us now to tell us about that. Thank you, Kovic. As we mentioned in the program, poverty is soaring in the UK. One of the reasons for this poverty is the government's austerity measures. Now, the British public says the austerity measures are at times driven by political desires, not economic necessities. Here's one tweet from one of our users. It took only seven years to get rid of 1,240 job centers, 535 libraries, 419 schools, 35 fire stations, and his list goes on and on. And he ends it by referencing to the Prime Minister as a threat. Now, austerity measures have hit Britain's hard, and those most at risk are children. Our state of nation today shows we're seeing unacceptable rises in child poverty as more parents are unable to make ends meet. So here's a post that breaks down those figures. Dr. Sonia Dalkin cites a report saying in a typical classroom of 30 children, nine are now living in poverty. Child poverty has been rising since 2011 and 4.1 million children are living in poverty, a rise of half a million in the last five years. Now, in the capital, poverty rates seem much higher, with Londoners suffering to pay for even housing accommodations. The post from London Poverty says 27% of Londoners live below the poverty line. In the rest of England, it's 21%. London's high housing costs are a key difference for the reason. Now, we have some footage for you from the Facebook page of Homeless Britain. It shows homeless people sleeping on the streets of Tottenham Court Road. And with that, even though the UK is the world's fifth largest economy, according to the UK, poverty levels in that country amount to social calamity and economic disaster. It is only appropriate to end this program with a soundbite from the special rapporteur, Philip Alston. There were many soundbites to choose from, but perhaps this is the most dangerous one. Poverty is really a major challenge in the United Kingdom and that not nearly enough is currently being done to address the challenges. On the other side, what I found in my discussions with ministers is basically a state of denial. Admitting that there is a problem is the first step 
in fixing the UK's poverty problem. The UK government needs to make a decision. That does it for this edition of Economic Divide. Do send us your questions and comments. We always appreciate them. Contact information is behind me. For me, Kavitha, my entire team, it's goodbye. Until next week.